from Hildik, who's working at the University of Bristol, um, and he's going to talk about uh, understanding volatility in multi component organic systems. <laughs> Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Tom Hilditch. Uh, I'm doing my PhD with Jonathan at the Bristol Aerosol Research Centre. So that's just up the hill in the School of Chemistry building. Uh, and my research focuses on looking at mixed component organic systems, specifically by experimenting on single droplets. Okay, so firstly, a background to organic aerosol. So organics come from a wide range of natural and anthropogenic sources, uh, which get emitted into the atmosphere. So those could be primary VOCs, such as terpenes, or primary aerosols, such as cooking oil. And these get processed in the atmosphere through a range of chemical mechanisms, and then undergo partitioning uh, to form our really complex, uh, compositionally complex aerosol. Okay, and so the properties of these aerosol, of these individual compounds, is going to determine their partitioning. And then the partitioning is going to determine their effects to climate, weather, and human health. So looking a bit closer at a single droplet, gas particle partitioning is a really complex picture. So you have organics coming on and off, and this is going to be determined by the saturation concentration of the atmosphere and the saturation uh, vapor pressure of the individual organics alongside its activity coefficient. And then we also have water coming on and off, which is going to be dependent on the RH of the atmosphere and the activity coefficient of the water. Um, I just thought I'd mention activity coefficient is essentially uh, describing the interactions that a compound has with the rest of the droplet. And so for a pure compound, the activity coefficient would be one because it's interacting perfectly with itself. But then an activity coefficient of below one would indicate that it's interacting more strongly than it would with itself. Okay, so along with these thermodynamic properties, we also have a range of kinetic properties, such as our diffusion coefficient, which is inherently related to the viscosity of the bulk as well. And then we also have the uh, reactivity in the bulk and at the surface as well. And all of these factors are interrelated. And so it becomes very, very difficult to understand the reason that something's evaporating or condensing and how quickly it's going to travel through the particle. Um, and it's also really computationally expensive to be able to model this, certainly for multiple droplets, as you would in a box model. And so what box models tend to do is eliminate these limitations, the kinetic limitations, and just focus on thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, so for these models, uh, the circled, the, the circled uh, properties here are all really sensitive um, to the overall result that you get from the box model. And they're also estimated. And this is due to the fact that we have tens to hundreds of thousands of individual species so we couldn't possibly experimentally determine all of these properties, so they have to be estimated. So the first thing that's important to realize is which of these species are relevant. Some species are always going to exist in the particle phase because they're very non-volatile, um, and some are always going to exist in the gas phase because of how volatile they are. Um, but the ones that are sort of halfway in between are the ones that are going to be especially sensitive to the input property that you assign it. Um, and the second thing, which is kind of the focus of this work, is how are we going to test that these model estimations are correct? So this moves on to my work. So simply, I'm dissolving a compound A with a compound B. Um, compound A is a semi-volatile, so this is the one that I'm interested in understanding. Um, and then compound B is the matrix compound. So this is going to be a low volatility compound, which isn't going to evaporate at all. And this is essentially what I'm doing is looking at the effects of compound B on the evaporation rate of compound A. <clears throat> so it's important that only compound A is evaporating. And so for this work, compound A is a dicarboxylic acid. These are atmospherically relevant, often used as analogs for oxidized organic aerosol. And they have uh, like a wealth of data in the literature as well. So we have saturation vapor pressures already for these, which allow me to look directly at the activity coefficients. And compound B is a non-volatile, non-ionic surfactant, it's a compound called tween 20. 
Um, and this is fairly low viscosity as well, which allows me to reside in that regime where only the vapor pressure is going to determine the evaporation rate. So we have no limitations of viscosity. I, if anything's going to evaporate, it's already at the surface. We don't have to worry about how quickly it gets through the, through the particle to get to the surface. Okay, and I'm measuring these, the evaporation of these droplets in an electrodynamic balance, or EDB for short. So a single particle is trapped in the center of the uh, chamber here, um, and we're collecting forward scattered light centered around 45 degrees in the forwards direction. Um, and then from this, we generate our phase functions, and the phase function can be analyzed to give us the radius. So you can see how we can then generate radius versus time blocks, which is our evaporation curves. Okay, now moving on to modeling evaporation in these two component systems. So for this, I use an iterative model, a liquid-like evaporation model, which is based off of the Maxwell equation. Uh, so I've just given an example here for a dicarboxylic acid called methyl succinic acid. We just have to input a bunch of properties such as the density and gas phase diffusion. Uh, and from this, we can generate a radius versus time block. So then to calculate the activity coefficient of the organic, we can simply take our experimental data, which we've got from the EDB here, and overlay our model data. And then for every single radius, we can convert that radius into a mole fraction, and then use this little equation here to give us our activity coefficient for that mole fraction. And that allows us to generate a plot of activity coefficient on the y-axis versus mole fraction on the x-axis. So then we're looking at how the composition changes. How does that affect the degree to which the two compounds are interacting with each other? Okay, so I did this for a range of different dicarboxylic acids. Um, and something to note is that malonic and butyric, the malonic and the butyric acids are what's called odd uh, dicarboxylic acids because of the fact that they have an odd number of carbons in their chain. And the even number of dicarboxylic acids are oxalic and succinic because they have an even number of carbons in their chain. Uh, and you can see that there is a different trend between the odd and the even number of dicarboxylic acids. Um, and the second thing to note is that these compounds are really strongly affected by their mole fraction. So the uh, activity coefficient is changing quite rapidly for very small changes in mole fraction, i.e. the composition is really important in determining how much they reside in the particle. And then I thought I would compare my results to an activity coefficient estimator. So AMFAC is a model which estimates the activity coefficient. So it's estimating what it thinks uh, compound A will interact with compound B. And what I've done here is I've taken my data and divided it by the activity coefficient from the AMFAC model. And you can see that the AMFAC model under predicts pretty much for every single compound at every single composition. Um, apart from the even number dicarboxylic acids, which the trend is very, very different. Um, so from this, we can see that AMFAC has not picked up on the even odd dependence that I'm seeing in my data. Otherwise, we would have the same trend for all. OK, um, to summarize, I've looked at a selection of multi-component droplets containing a dicarboxylic acid and a tween 20. Uh, I suspended them in the EDB, and then I've measured their evaporation rate, from which I've generated activity coefficient versus mole fraction plots, and I've compared that against AMFAC. And the two major conclusions from this work are, firstly, that the experimental activity coefficient really strongly depends on the composition. Uh, and this is something that is not picked up on by the activity coefficient model. And so for the future, I think um, certainly more functionalities need to be looked into to look at whether AM fact picks up on these other functionalities as well. Um, and we also need to look at the effects of isomerism because this could have a major effect. And in the case of the even versus odd dependence, clearly the position of the two functional groups relative to each other is determining the activity coefficient. Uh, so I'd just like to thank my group uh, just up the hill and um, thanks to the funding from the CDT and the STL.
Thanks very much, John. Are there any questions in the room to start with? Yeah, I do know that. Um, you, I think you compared, you, you did a little summary of the two in the same way. You just need one um, level of two, and how you compare with zero to one. You get one of the two in comparison, and you don't have to interact with the two. Oh, so if it didn't have any screen in it, that would just be a pure component droplet. And so I suppose what I would be doing at that point would be just comparing my vapor pressure against the saturation vapor pressure in the literature. Um, but that's not possible to do for these dicarboxylic acids because without the tween, they would crystallize. So then I'd be looking at a solid vapor pressure as opposed to an atmospherically relevant liquid like vapor pressure. So the, the, the original reason why I put the tween in was actually to keep the droplets in a kind of amorphous liquid like phase, which is relevant for the atmosphere. Um, but then it turns out I kind of stumbled upon looking at mixed component volatility, uh, which is again relevant. And it turns out that it's really important to look at compounds in different other compounds rather than just looking at pure compound of its own and relying on these activity coefficient estimators. Thanks. Well, one more question. You uh, um, so I've got some um, really interesting stuff. Uh, so, what's the best guess of what the battery cycling would be on the effects of the uh, pieces within the bacteria? Um, so, I think the, the interactions are probably with the OH groups on the tween. And it might be that there's some perfect ring type structure where you have a hydrogen bond of six carbons, which is perfect for the odd versus even. But to be honest, I haven't looked at it very much yet. But it's some, it could be something like that, where you have a really stable hydrogen bonded cyclic structure. Well, thank you very much, Thomas.